that that's the only reason I do it is for the feeling of making the beat, not for the money or, or for the fame or whatever. That's, you know, that's secondary. But it's always for the love of just trying to create a sound, you know? I use the MPC in the Golden Era time and I use the SP1200. I think what separates any producer in any era it ain't really about the equipment, it's just about, you know, their creativity, that's all. I was just, I had a different, I'm not from New York, you know what I'm saying? But I was inspired by New York music. And I just had a different way of looking at it. Like Primo is from Texas. So he has a different way of looking at hip hop. You know what I mean? That's all, that was, that was my little edge, I guess. Specifically on your come up as a producer, how did Uptown Saturday Night shape you into the producer you are now? Uptown Saturday Night, wow. It just made, it made me reach out, you know what I'm saying? It made me um, just listen to different types of styles of music. It made, it made me go into a whole nother a world, like kind of outside the box, being at Camp Lois, an outside the box type of group, you know what I mean? So I had to make up a soundscape that kind of complemented Whatever the hell they was talking about, they definitely, they definitely helped me develop as a producer. How did that relationship come about? Um, me and Sway, Sway used to live on my block. Right, matter of fact, I used to live on his block because I was the outside. I was from out of town, <laughs> so I moved to his block. And um, you know, he was a young cat at the time, still young. And um, he just told me he wanted to rap, and I heard him rap, and um, he was okay. I took him to Clark's house, Clark Kent. We did a song, recorded him. He was like amazed at himself, you know, recorded. I think like a year later, he came back and he had Chiba with him. And they had, you know, it was Cam Low. And I heard him rap and I was like, yo, y'all, I like, I like y'all style, I like what y'all doing. And that's how we kind of like, you know. Came yeah, that's how it came together. It was, it was no rules. We just did what we wanted to do. We wasn't concerned about getting on the radio. We wasn't concerned about selling 100 million dollars. I mean, 100 million records. We just wanted to create what we wanted to create, and it came out dope. First, we dropped. I think we dropped Coolie High. That was the first thing, and and the record did okay. It really didn't do good. And then uh, Profile put out Lucini, and I remember like a week later. You know, I just start watching the record sales of the album just go up crazy. Like, you know, we were selling like 10,000, 20,000 records a week. You know what I'm saying? And it was amazing. Like, that was my first time ever watching a project that I totally produced myself blow up. You know what I mean? And just to see them, you know, go from dudes that used to live on my block to like superstars was amazing to me. You know what I mean? It's just that energy, it's just everybody, you know, wanna feel good, you know? And everybody wanna get that Lucini. Lucini is, Tom, that's a Thomas concept. This is it, what? You know what I'm saying? It's like one of those records, man. It's one of those records that has that energy. There's some type of spirit in that music, you know what I mean? Do you remember your mindset, just putting that instrument together? Yeah, it was just making beats, man, you know? It wasn't no mindset, it was just like, that's dope. You know what I'm saying? Just blank canvas, chopping shit up. Making it, making another one. The is like an anthem, like even to this day. Yeah. Um, you actually just brought up Coolie High, working with Lucini. Mm -hmm. I mean, with uh, Camp Low. Um, would you say there's any other particular tracks that you feel should have, I guess, got more recognition than it did at the time? I mean, shoot, the whole album, man. Sparkle was crazy, uh, Crystal Carrington was ill, Black Connection was out of control. Um, all those records was dope back then, you know what I mean? I mean, what happened was, I think what happened when they was at there, when they was coming up, Profile Records, the owner of Profile, he sold the company. So, and I think LaFace or Arista picked it up and Camp Law had to start back over. And um, Arista didn't know how to work them. 
they didn't know what they was doing. When they got Cam Low, they was trying to change him a little bit. They was trying to make them do records that they would never do. That's why it took so long for them to come back out. And by the time they came back out, it was hard for them to get that, you know, that buzz back that they had. during the transition of the millennium that has made hip-hop sound so much. Because now it has a definite sound. The mainstream hip-hop has a definite cookie-cutter factory. It's so repetitive. Yeah, it's like a sound now. That's what, you know, and it's like, all you have to do is create that sound, and if it's good enough, you can damn near get on now. You know what I mean? It's a shame, you know? It ain't, it's like, but I'm not bashing everybody because like I said before, there are creative people doing it. But for the most part, what you hear on the radio is like, it's the radio. What do you think sparked that? Because it was like, what, early 2000s? It but you was know what like it is, money, it's always money. Money, money, you know what I'm saying? Anytime, big business. You got a sound that's selling and everybody go, oh shoot, that's what's selling, that's what's making uh, Drake or, uh, Little Wayne or whomever blow up, then we got to do that too. You know what I'm saying? That's the fastest way that people try to get on by imitating somebody else. Backpedaling a bit, before you start staying production appointment, you were an MC. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about your struggles and overcoming as an MC and related to the MC that's coming out today. I didn't have a struggle. It never felt like a struggle. It always felt like it was just fun, you know? As a rapper, you know, I just, I did everything that a rapper was supposed to do. Talent shows first, you know what I'm saying? Got known off talent shows. Start, uh, got with a crew, started doing shows. Got known off shows, then made a record, put it out on the, on the radio. It played, you know what I'm saying? Back in the day when they would play independent, independent artists on the radio, they played that stuff. Next thing you know, um, I was in New York. We had this one record when I was in this group in North Carolina called the Busy Boys. We had this one record that blew up. And uh, at the time, they had the Mr. Magic Marley Marshall. They called us to the station. We did an interview and all that. And next thing you know, I was in New York and I never left. What was the role that Dame Dash had? Dame Dash was, he was there that day when I signed the deal with Atlantic and Clark was like, yo, this is Dame Dash. And at the time, Darian Dash was there too, Dame's cousin. He said, they want to manage you. And I'm saying, all right, cool, they can do it. And from then on, me and Dame have been cool. How did that relationship evolve? Friendship and business? Friendship, you know, he's my man, we cool. Um, business wise, you know, we, we, we do a, some partnership things like, you know, the pilot talks and the 24-hour crisis schools, that's our thing together, you know, and currency, obviously. And, um, you know, whatever, you know, Dame is always doing something and incorporating me, you know, to do, to help him do some something musical in whatever he's doing. Initial goal for the crisis school was just to put out, you know, just some dope hip hop shit. <laughs> and um, the next, we're gonna do the same thing over again. It's already in the works. We got some cool Another people. Chapter to the 24 hour crisis, or just... Part three. 24 hour crisis school part three. We're working on it now. In the 90s, I feel like it was more about showing on mainstream outlets. Do you, do you feel that's the same now? Um, no, definitely. It's it's uneven battlefield right now. Uh, mainstream is 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 the radio is the radio, definitely political. And um, you know, underground is really underground now. But back in the day, like I was saying earlier, it was a balance. You had mainstream and you had underground on the radio, you know, they both shared the airwaves. So it was, you know, it was, it was, you had more of a variety, you had more, you know, different things to listen to. Now it's just sort of like one kind of style, a hip hop that's on the radio, you know. But you know, not to take nothing away from it, cause some of it is good, obviously, but some of it is, you know, the, the sounds redundant. What do you think is kind of going against that wave right now? Kendrick. Yeah, Kendrick, um, Absol, um, 
Dang. Joey. Joey Badass. Currency always, you know what I mean? You definitely got true hip hop people out here. How do you uh, go about finding artists? Or do artists find you just like up and coming artists? Totally? Yeah, people just seem to just I just be at the right place at the right time, I guess. I don't know. Do you have a criteria for, or like, oh, I'm not going to work with this artist because, mm -mm. or is this like you're open to listen to anybody? Yeah, I'm pretty open. Yeah. That's how you find the hot, the hot new people, you know? You can't just be. Bias. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? A lot of, you know, producers in the game, they kind of shut everybody out because they kind of get on this little ego pedestal and they're like, I can't work with you no more. Yeah, I done did that. Let me, you know, go there. But then there's so many dope people, you know, that's so dope that nobody even heard of musicians and rappers and singers, and you know? I like being that guy. I like being the guy to find that. Yeah, I heard him first. You heard him on my beat first, right? You know? That's the only way to create. You gotta be, um, you can't have no goal in mind when you're creating, because that takes away from the creative part of it. If I'm sitting here trying to make a particular beat for a particular audience or a particular sound, then it's never gonna come out right. But if I'm just banging around, playing around, then I'm gonna make something that's just totally art because it's just coming from nowhere. It's just, I like that. Let me make another one, you know what I mean? That's how we do it. If hip hop were a person, what would you say to her? <laughs> um, stop fucking so many niggas. You know what I mean? If hip hop was a girl, that's exactly what I'd say to her. Yo, stop fucking with so many niggas all the time. How are you able to make so many beats with Jay-Z? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, Jay-Z is a great artist. Um, someone I always wanted to work with, and I finally got a chance once I met Kanye and worked with Kanye. And, you, know, you know, we always crossed paths in the 90s, but we never really got, you know, in that solid space like him and DJ Premier did. You know what I mean? So, I would, I, that would be the question I would ask him and call him a lucky bastard. Because <laughs> <laughs> Jay was part of my crew. It was me, Dame, Jay, Tone, Chubby. That was my crew, you know what I mean? That was Rockefeller, you know? I'm part of Rockefeller, so. And I was, the, I was like one of the in-house producers at the time for Rockefeller. At the time it was me and Clark. That was super, super in-house. Then when he went outside, you know, he got Primo and a couple other people. But yeah, and Fleo, plus Jay was, you know, I lived around the corner from him. So he always came to my house and we always recorded. That's it. <laughs>